Hello and welcome to our special week of shows coming to you from our Asia Broadcast Centre in Kuala Lumpur. Can Malaysia's Prime Minister-in-waiting overcome the political and ethnic divisions facing his country? Najib Razak joins us today with some answers. A serious lack of confidence in Malaysia's political system is putting the country's future leadership in question. With Prime Minister Abdullah Ahmed Badawi due to step down in March next year and his deputy Najib Razak lined up to replace him. A public cynicism towards the ruling coalition, the United Malays National Organization or UMNO, is targeted towards Mr. Razak who sits under a cloud of allegations that even include a link to a murder case which he has denied. On top of that, his coalition lost significant support in elections earlier this year. Well, Mr. Razak has a strong pedigree as the son of the second leader of the nascent Malaysia, Abdul Razak, and the nephew of the third premier, Hussein On. But critics wonder if that's enough to guarantee the public support he needs at a time when the country is facing serious divisions. Today we ask, can Najib Razak resolve Malaysia's political and ethnic divides? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can log on to livestation.com forward slash AGE enter the chat room and then you can take part. Of course, we also welcome your phone calls on the show as well. Well, Malaysia's Deputy Prime Minister, the man lined up to lead the country, Datu Seri Najib Razak, is with me here today to take your questions. I welcome you to the show, sir. Thank you. There's a phrase being touted around that uh, leadership under you um, is, or would be, a return to Mahathirism. Uh, are people going to accept uh, leadership wanting more controls in areas such as uh, the you know, media freedoms and perhaps security um, when they've been used to a lot more openness, they say, under the, the current uh, Prime Minister? I realize there is a new uh, Malaysia today, a uh, Malaysia that has changed, a Malaysia that has evolved, a Malaysian society that has become more uh, matured, more sophisticated, and a society that demands uh, openness, demands uh, concerns relating to human rights, civil liberties, and a more sophisticated level of uh, understanding of their requirements. So I think uh, as, as, as a government, uh, we, you know, we have to respond to this new Malaysia. Now, do you, as an individual, as a, as a potential leader for this country, offer enough change? Would you can you address the issues society is asking for, or is there da the danger of business as usual? We have to draw lessons from the last general elections. Uh, you know, we did, uh, although we won, and uh, we, achieved a two, we achieved a simple majority, we, did, we lost a two-thirds majority, and we lost five states. Mm -hmm. So we realized the electorate wanted to send us a message, and therefore we have to draw lessons from the last general elections. I've, I've been saying very openly that we have to reform, and we have to change. Otherwise, the public or the people will change us. And interestingly enough, uh, Prime Minister Badawi is, is still trying to be very active prior to uh, any change in leadership uh, in, in the first quarter of next year. Uh, he's determined to put in some judicial and social reforms that are based on that public feedback, as you say, the new Malaysia. Uh, and he wants to meet the demands of those people. Do you agree with those policies? I mean, are they likely to remain intact uh, once, once you take the helm? Of course, there's a continuity. I'm committed to the reforms. For example, he wants to uh, strengthen the judiciary. I think that's important, to have judiciary that's uh, beyond reproach, a uh, judiciary that uh, has the confidence of the people. And uh, he wants to fight corruption by strengthening the anti-corruption agency. I think these two reforms uh, will send a very clear message to the electorate that we are listening to them. And uh, we believe in, in strengthening the institutions and, and good governance in this country. Now, I know you're known to have concerns about uh, the way the media is sometimes and uh, concerns about perhaps the way the media is expanded in this country. What, what are your particular concerns? Is it the blogging? Is it the way uh, the media approaches the stories? I'm more concerned about, about them telling the truth. Uh, you know, whether it's, it's the main uh, you know, public uh, or the mainstream media or the alternative media or the new media, uh, th it's important for them to tell the truth. Uh, and and if, if they tell lies or if they tell half-truth or if they make uh, baseless allegations, then they should be responsible for whatever they say or print. 
I want to get on to some of the priorities, but before I do, there's, there's a, I just want to touch on something that there's a lot of people who worry about the way Malaysian politics is shaping up, that perhaps people are already looking to the future and that, uh, you know, the, the situation is being dominated somewhat by a proxy race, that there's a lot of focus, for example, on the, on the future of the son of the former Prime Minister, uh, Dr. Mahathir, and the son-in-law of uh, uh, Dr. Badawi, the current uh, Premier. Does that complicate your position in any way, that this, this sort of sideline race is running for, for looking even further ahead? I think it goes to show that UMNO is an open and, and very democratic party. I mean, we cannot arrange for things to happen. Um, you know, the, the second or even the third generation, they're coming to the fore. And, 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 and they want to participate in, in the electoral or the democratic process in a party. So I think I would welcome that. Well, Dr. Seri, what, what are your priorities? I mean, uh, at the helm, what would you really want to focus on, first and foremost? Well, it's not quite uh, appropriate for me to answer at this uh, juncture because, you know, I've not taken over and yes. Prime Minister Abdul Abdawi is still in the seat and I would want to respect that. But basically, um, you know, we have to uh, cater for uh, our base, first of all, and, and that's, that's, we're talking about the Malays and, 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 and the Bumi Putras in this country. They are our, our main supporters for UMNO itself. Right. But UMNO and Barasa National must also address the non-Malays. And I believe in this uh, concept of uh, a multiracial government. I believe that we must cater for the interests of the Malays as well as the needs and aspiration of the non-Malays. Uh, if, if there are genuine grievances, legitimate grievances of the non-Malays, then we must cater for them. So it's a question of balancing between the two. Now on the show, of course, we concentrate a lot on viewer questions. We had a huge number of emails for you, by the way. Um, many of them touched on common, common areas. And I'm going to try and get a few of them in here. Uh, and one of them is from actually from Malaysia. Many came from Malaysia. Ronnie here in Malaysia uh, wrote in saying, why maintain the Malay supremacy policy, which only benefits some? Now, I know you've addressed that somewhat. Why ban the Hindraf? Uh, they didn't do anything wrong. And why maintain the Internal Security Act, which was meant for terrorists, but is being used against citizens? Well, you know, I've, I've said openly that uh, I believe in a policy of gradual liberalization of uh, some of the elements of the new economic policy. Um, as the Bumiputras become uh, more secure, more confident, uh, and more uh, developed, then uh, there will be less need for us to have uh, the elements of the new economic policy or the affirmative actions in this country. Uh, but it has to be a gradual process. Uh, at the same time, uh, we must be fair to the non malays And I think the government has taken steps. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in terms of uh, education, for example, if you secure nine A's at the SPM level, which is equivalent to O level, okay. and irrespective of whether you are Malay, Chinese, or Indian, or Karazan, or Iban, then automatically the government will give you a scholarship uh, to enroll into a public university in the country. So that is an example of a new initiative uh, that the government has uh, initiated. And in my uh, fiscal incentive package, which I announced in Parliament uh, early uh, in November, uh, we gave 50 million each, 50 million to Chinese schools, 50 million to Tamil schools, 50 million to mission schools, and 50 million to the uh, Islamic schools that are part of the uh, Ministry of Education. Let me touch briefly on a part of that question, though, sir, about the ISA, the Internal Security Act. Why, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Ronnie was saying it's meant for terrorists, but he feels that it's being used against citizens. No, I realize that. Uh, I, think, I think there is a very strong raison d'etre, you know, for the existence of the uh, Internal Security Act. Um, you know, I mean, look what happened in Mumbai. And, and you realize that uh, you cannot take security for granted. And the only reason, or rather the main reason, why there have been no serious acts of uh, terrorism in this country is because we have in place the Internal Security Act. But, if it's but at the same time, I realize that what is important now is to realize that people are more concerned about civil liberties. Right. Therefore, what is important is that how you apply the Internal Security Act. And I, I realize there are some controversies relating to how the ISA has been used lately, and therefore we intend to address them in the future.
Let's get in Carl, who's come on the line, and it was to be expected we'd get quite a few calls from Malaysia. Carl's here in Malaysia. Carl, what would you like to ask? Yeah, yeah good evening. Yes, yes I can ahead, hear. Please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Good with the, with the terrorist attacks which which happened in Mumbai, I'm concerned with the recent alleged linkage of a ta of some of those terrorists with Malaysia and the general security in our country. So my question is, do you reckon that Malaysia's security forces, i.e. the anti-terrorist squad, the intelligence agency, or the police, whether are they well equipped and trained to deal with terrorist attacks in our country? And are the forces doing enough to prevent okay. Malaysia from suffering from the same fate as India? All right. Well, those uh, allegations are, are, are unfounded. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, terrorists uh, uh, coming from Malaysia. We have no evidence of that. And with respect to our security forces, I can assure you, uh, they are competent, they are well trained, and and so far we have not uh, encountered any serious form of security uh, of terrorist attacks in Malaysia. I think there were reports that they were using Malaysian passports. That's why. Well, they could be using, but they're not. Uh, so far, no evidence that they are Malaysians. Right, Dr. Sedi, we've got to take a very short break here. More on this discussion with Malaysia's Deputy Prime Minister Najib Razak in a moment. As we pause, let me remind you, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments by logging on to livestation.com. Enter the chat room. There's a debate taking place there right now. We'll be right back. <laughs>